And now we saw a little bit of that. These these identical twins were born identical in the in the video, and presumably also the live ones we saw earlier. But they they changed somehow during development, during life, and and I think sort of the way our genes are involved in aging is an, another issue that has interested a lot of people. And the next talk is really focused on epigenetic changes in the lifespan. And the next talk will be given by uh, Thomas Espeset, who's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Oslo. So please. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm the outsider here. I'm a psychologist. And, uh, uh, doesn't even do research on epigenetics. I've been interested in that for some time, uh, but it's been hard to find a good way of studying epigenetics in humans, and especially with regards to cognition. But now uh, things have happened in the field, new techniques, new knowledge, so it might be possible for the first time. So I haven't done it. Uh, this is uh, just my inspiration, one, or one of them actually. So I'm going to talk about something that is known as the epigenetic clock, one of perhaps several of genetic clocks, but this is about age. Um, generally, in aging, we know that our genes' uh, activity levels change um, a lot. And uh, you see that some of these, some of these uh, gene groups, like synaptic transmission um, uh, and, uh, and genes related to learning, uh, are strongly downregulated with increasing age, but while others uh, like the ones related to stress response, DNA repair, and inflammation, and so on, are strongly upregulated. Um, some of these changes might be related to epigenetic changes. For instance, the methylation, DNA methylation, as we saw a little bit about in the movie um, previously. So we can see in general, uh, when a gene expression goes down, typically the DNA methylation is higher. That is a general finding, then. Uh, not necessarily true in every case. Um, <clears throat> so there is then a change in DNA methylation uh, in normal aging, but uh, it appears that it, it is related to two different categories, two different types. So one type, if we take them uh, as a, a starting point, uh, um, a, a, a specific methylation to a specific site in the genome, and see that it increases with age, it can be related to what they term epigenetic drift. In this case, this could be related to, to uh, a certain part of the genome, typically an, or, or typically an intergenic area that uh, can uh, be downregulated or hypomethylated with increased age. But the important point here is that this is idiosyncratic, it is individual, it's special for one individual. So the only way to actually study it and find the, the part of the genome where this happens is to have a longitudinal design, to check the same individual uh, at several uh, time points. But then there's another new way of looking at it, and this is known as epigenetic clock or clock, uh, uh, clock um, uh, CPGs and or, or clock regions of, of the epigenome. And here, it, it, it seems that there's a consistent pattern. So if you find an increase in methylation of this part of the genome in one individual, we're likely to find it in another as well. So this gives us the possibility to use the epigen uh, epigenetic measures to predict aging in different individuals and also for different types of tissues. Um, so this is, um, this is the, uh, I think, the most famous clock uh, version. It is developed by Steve Horvath. At UCLA, and what he did was to acquire data from, from, from the web, more or less. So he had about 80 different samples uh, that had uh, methylation from uh, around 50 different tissues of the body. And uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, from skin cells, from various parts of the brain, from various cell types in, in blood, from uh, cell types in, in the buccal cells and from saliva, and many, many more. And um, what he did was to take methylation data that comes from two different chips, uh, so-called microarray <coughs> chips, that can, can type these um, um, uh, methylations, and he selected about 21,000 of them, the ones that overlap between two different that are commonly used chips in the market. Uh, and then what he did 
was to use a statistical algorithm to select automatically the ones that uh, were related to um, age, chronological age, in about half of the samples that he had. So he used that as a training set. And uh, what he found, quite remarkably, was that these 353 clock CPGs uh, were strongly related to the chronological age in those about, I think it was about 7,000 individuals or something like that. So we see the different numbers and different colors here are, are from the different samples that was used. And then in this training set, um, the correlation with chronological age was about 0.97. And the average error of estimate was about 2.9 years. So basically, within the sample, you could use, you could use the methylation status to, to predict age. But then, of course, they would, would predict the age in the same individuals that he used. So the, the trick would be to carry this over to an independent sample, and that's what he did next. And then looked at the second part of the, of, the, of the samples that he had access to. And even here, we can see that the correlation is about 0 0.96. So quite amazingly, you can just take the methylation status and, and predict age um, in an independent sample. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, this, this was published just a couple of years ago, and uh, quite a few studies have been published already on it. Uh, <clears throat> So one indication that this might actually work, that this is actually some metric of, of um, cellular aging, uh, we can see from this a famous uh, graph from Waddington's genetic landscape. So this is then, you can see that this is a stem, uh, you can say that this is a stem cell, and during uh, differentiation, this can be then skin cell, glial cell, and neuron cell, or so on. And uh, uh, this stem cell, the, ep the embryonic stem cell, has an DNA methylation age of about zero, which would make sense. And then when it is specialized, and uh, as we acquire data from people who have lived so for some time, then the DNA age is, is more than zero. But if you use a technique called induced pluripotent stem cell, uh, in, um, in, in, well, you can actually take a cell from a differentiated state back to sort of a stem cell status. And what you see there is that also the DNA methylation age goes back to about zero. So how can this be used? Well, there's, only, there's on, not only a correlation with chronolo chronological age, you can see, we saw in the graphs that there's some individual difference in it. There's some variation along the regression line. So it appears that some people um, are methylation-wise or epigenetically older than the, the chronological age would, uh, would predict. And also, some people tend to be younger. So we could see that we could say that some people are epigenetically old and uh, exhibit fast aging, and others are epigenetically young and are uh, and have typically slow aging. So, and then we have all the ones in, in, in the middle, and we could imagine that uh, this uh, epigenetic aging would be related to health measures. So in this case, we have relative health there on the y-axis, and then the different types of uh, epigenetic aging on these different graphs. So this would be sort of the normal range. And then we have people who are slow, have slow aging, and are epigenetically young. We would predict that they would have a, the typical age rate pattern uh, later than, uh, than uh, sort of the, the, the mean. And then also the opposite, it would be it could treat it as a risk factor. And actually, when age is a risk factor for, for a certain type of pathology, we could imagine that the epigenetic age would predict the disease better than age itself. So are there any uh, evidence for this? There's one study that was just published about centenarians, people who are over 100, year, 100 years. So you had this group of people that I think the mean age of this group was about 105 years. And also, they had data from their offspring and compared that with controls. So you see, when we have chronological, chronological age of the x-axis and, uh, and methylation, methylation age on the y-axis, you can see that the offspring of the centenarians uh, seem to have slow aging. So they're, yeah, uh, they're likely not necessarily to be as old as their parents, but at least older uh, than normal controls, and their aging seems to be also slower. 
Um, <clears throat> here's from another study showing that if you have fast aging or age acceleration, um, <clears throat> you are also likely to basically die younger. And from two different uh, versions of the of the DNA methylation age. So this is done from the Horvath uh, measure, and then this is a, an alternative one, and they have quite similar results. And there are many other ways of uh, using this, apparently, and probably more that we haven't seen yet. This is from a study showing um, differential aging in different parts of the brain. So uh, this is from from people over 110 10 years old, so there are many other age groups in that study, but you can see that the cerebellum seems to have a slow aging as compared to different other parts of the brain of the same person. Uh, we could use it to look at uh, different syndromes. In this case, there's a, there's a comparison of individuals with Down syndrome uh, and uh, Alzheimer's disease and their normal controls. We can see that individuals with Down syndrome have an accelerated aging or faster aging than both the other groups. So you see here the regression line. Uh, AD didn't have any accelerated aging in this study, but if we have um, uh, if we have epigenetic measures from from the biomarkers, the regions with, uh, for instance, plaques and tangles in AD patients, we can then compare acceleration in those cells. Um, dependent on the level of, um, of the biomarkers, and you can see that the, the, higher, the more, uh, higher the level of the biomarkers, the, the faster the epigenetic aging. And then, well, more into my interest directly, uh, for cognitive decline, there hasn't been much done on that. This one study, they found effects on cognitive performance in a, in a very old sample, which is also longitudinal, but there's only three year follow-up. Uh, periods and they didn't find any directly direct effect on on decline as such, but they found it on on the absolute uh, quality performance. There's one study also looking at PTSD as a function of uh, trauma in uh, in the war in Afghanistan. It seems that the tra level of trauma also uh, predicts um, um, increased aging or accelerated aging in, the, in those individuals, and then. We can imagine, well, any disease that is related to age, and where age is a, is a risk factor, or any disease that is somehow related to the biology of neurodegeneration might be uh, sensitive to this um, uh, genetic, uh, epigenetic clock. So, for instance, schizophrenia or depression or a host of other uh, types of, of diagnosis, I, I, I would guess, would be potentially relevant. Um, and there might be studies on this already in the pipeline, who knows? Um, yeah, so I just, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, can, we can ask, of course, uh, what, what kind of mechanisms is, is uh, underlying this, whether this is simply a, a, a sort of a predictor or a, or a statistical predictor, or if there's something, uh, some biological mechanism that is directly related, related to aging. Um, at least it seems that it is in part genetically uh, determined because the heritability in this study and in several others uh, indicate that the heritability is around 40% for, um, for the epigenetic clock in individuals. So with that, thanks for your attention.